Production funding for QED with Dr. B is provided by American Electric Power Foundation, boundless energy for brighter futures, and by viewers like you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Frederick Bertley, immunologist and educator. Science is everywhere and for everyone, and it's all around us, shaping our lives every single day. In this series, we'll look at cutting-edge research, talk to the scientists who are charting new frontiers, and solving today's problems to make all our lives better. When a scientist or mathematician demonstrates a proof of concept in their work, they often use the term QED, quad erat demonstratum. That roughly translates to quite easily demonstrated. Welcome to QED with Dr. B. Welcome to COSI, the Center of Science and Industry, voted the number one science museum in the nation by USA Today. Of course, we're on with QED with Dr. B in partnership with our famous, fantastic partner, WOSU. Couldn't be happy to have you here, producer Diana, to be with us on the show. And today is the science of taste, and we have none other than the national phenom, Jenny Brittenbauer, founder and CEO of Jenny's Ice Cream. Jenny, thank you for being with us today. Hey, it's so great to be here. You got into the ice cream kind of through the art scene, but you've definitely leveraged science to figure out how to maximize taking two or three or five different flavors together to blend this creamy, rich, incredible product that we all love. How do you do it? Talk to us about the science of this. Well, you're right. I did come through art. In fact, I rejected science for my entire life. I thought I was terrible at it. And uh, it turns out if you want to make something, and I mean ice cream to art, you really do have to know a little bit about science. Um, and, and that's maybe my way in was through ice cream. So I wanted to bring these beautiful flavors to life in, um, and, and make them really pop. And one of the ways that we do that is by not using stabilizers and emulsifiers, which are sort of thickeners that people use in ice cream, but they can actually create a barrier between f taste uh, on your tongue. And so we work with milk proteins to kind of make milk proteins act that way. And what you get is this really pure, pop of flavor, so that's one thing. Another thing that's really important is how it melts. We're, we're very aware of how the ice cream is gonna melt on your tongue and bloom all of that flavor into your nose. So we make ice cream, I always say I make ice cream to be licked, or you know, just eaten directly out of a pint. <laughs> so so let, me, let me ask you another follow-up question. So, so A, you figure out how you wanna combine flavors chemically, but then there's a second layer of how they combine and actually melt in your mouth and get another either aromatic or a secondary kind of flavor profile. And you put all that together by understanding science? Absolutely, I and mean, it really does go back to how the ice cream melts. I mean, it's how much we're putting in there, you know, of whatever flavoring ingredient it is. And sometimes we need, you know, something like mint is gonna be like steeping and actually infusing the butter fat, the fat that's in all milk, that's in milk and cream, um, infusing that with a scent because flavor, most of it's actually scent. And so you're gonna infuse the butter fat with scent. Some flavors like strawberries are actually very high in water and actually the scent is a water soluble scent. So it is actually water that's gonna kind of scent the water that's already in milk too. Milk is 87% water, but it's really cool because water turns to ice and ice crystals in ice cream, right? So you have to counter that on the other side molecularly or else you get really icy ice cream. So it is all about this very delicate balance of how you put every ingredient together to really make it pop. That's so fantastic. Listen, we have you here all show and we're excited. We're gonna come back to a few things, but first we wanna talk about the science behind how we taste and this mind-body connection. And for that, we're going to Dr. Dana Small, professor of psychiatry and psychology at the Yale School of Medicine. From an evolutionary perspective, why do we even have the sense of taste? It's actually a really great question. But first, we have to start with making sure we're on the same page with what we mean by taste. So if you ask somebody like me, a chemosensory scientist, what I mean by taste is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, or savory. If you asked somebody from the general public what they mean by taste, they probably mean flavor. And flavor is very different from taste. So flavor is a multi-sensory perception that is actually made in the brain. 
So flavor is made of the taste inputs, the smell inputs, and the somatosensory inputs. And there's, in fact, different evolutionary pressures to create the sense of taste compared to flavor. So then what is the evolutionary benefit to the sense of taste? Tastes like sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and savory evolve to identify nutrients and energy in our foods, as well as spoilage and most importantly, toxins. So most substances that are poisonous have a bitter taste. So if we take bitter taste, there are many things in the world that are poisonous and the structure of those chemicals are very different. So we evolved many different types of bitter receptors to be able to recognize all those different poisons. But when we sense them, it produces sort of a singular perception, which is bitter. And we're born disliking bitter for a good reason. We don't want to have to learn the relationship between bitter and poison because that would be rather perilous for any organism. And sweet is just the opposite. So whenever we sense something sweet, it generally means there's sugar present. The more sweet something is, the more sugar is present. And so we're born liking sweet taste because all organisms have to acquire energy in order to survive. If this is a hardwired evolutionary character's trait for us, in nature, how come there hasn't been an evolution for poisonous stuff to taste sweet? Well, yeah, so it's true that uh, we're not the only organism life form evolving. Yeah, and there's definitely poisons that do taste sweet. And in fact, that's sort of where flavor comes in. Flavor preferences, unlike taste, are learned. And they are learned by pairing sensory experience with a physiological experience like feeling ill or nauseous or unconscious signals, actually, that are generated when we metabolize foods that tell our cells that there's energy present and our cells are able to get that energy. They send a signal to the brain that tells us that the food is good. So if we take like a berry, which can be sweet but poisonous, that berry is not just sweet, it has a berry taste. And that berry taste is not taste at all. It's actually flavor, and it's coming from the olfactory system. The taste part is sweetness, maybe a tiny bit of bitter. And the smell part is berry. And that comes when you chew it. The volatiles in your mouth from chewing the substance actually go from the oral cavity to the nasal cavity. And in the nose, those volatiles bind to receptors in an, a place called the olfactory epithelium. And then we perceive berry. I think the, the most interesting implication of these findings is actually for prevention and understanding the modern food environment. When you think about processed foods, you have all kinds of weird combinations of sensation that are no longer related to the nutritive properties. And the system really gets messed up. And some of the work in my lab has shown that when you consume even small amounts of foods that are like this, sort of mismatched, you can develop very rapidly insulin resistance and your brain response changes. And so this whole principle that it's really the metabolic signals that's driving reward and thinking about the modern food environment, I believe one of the fundamental reasons why we have an obesity and diabetes pandemic on our hands. We're gonna make some ice cream for our own. A cup of sugar, followed by five cups of half and half milk cream, followed by about a third of a cup of glucose liquid sugar, followed by whatever the flavor you're using. In this case, we're using vanilla. Once you feel like all the particles have dissolved, then you add your liquid nitrogen. Now the cool thing here is what the liquid nitrogen does. Now liquid nitrogen is minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Speeds up the process. You can make your ice cream in a minute to, you know, to two minute stops. The other cool thing about the liquid nitrogen is it freezes so quickly that you get these tiny crystals instead of these big crystals. And that's one of the secrets that makes the ice cream really creamy, smooth, and just without that crystal flow. Oh, wow, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. 
Yummy, yummy. So Jenny, clearly we use liquid nitrogen, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit to make this ice cream quickly. But what's the optimal temperature to make ice cream in general on your ice cream? Well, the optimal temperature is very, very cold, not far from uh, what you're doing with liquid nitrogen. Um, the way that I think about it actually is also, is really what temperature do we want to extrude it at? So that's about 15 degrees, but not only is it frozen, the ice crystals are tumbled and the exact right amount of air is whipped in. Air is important, and the best way to think of it is this. If you just took a, uh, you know, your, your cream and sugar and any other ingredients and froze it as is, it would be like a brick, right? Air is important because it makes it lush and creamy and scoopable. Air is actually really, really important in ice cream for that reason. It actually makes it taste creamier. Okay. It makes it melt in the perfect way on your tongue. That is absolutely fascinating. Air is an ingredient in ice cream, if you can imagine. So Jenny, you said that ice cream is that perfect neutral base for tasting flavors. Why is that? Well, a whole bunch of really cool reasons. I mean, of course, the flavor of cream is just beautiful. It's like a, a lush backdrop for anything that you want to put on top of it. But more specifically, and, and from a science point of view, butterfat melts two degrees below body temperature. Not all fats are like that. They all have different melting points. And so you can load it with scent and flavor lock it in in the freezing process and the moment it hits your tongue the warmth of your body it relaxes and volatilizes all of that scent into your head you know and that's where you get that scent and then as you lick it continues to build so it's this beautiful way of um of experiencing flavor and all of the bounty that grows on earth <laughs> i love that and, and what I love about Jenny's ice creams is that no matter what flavor I taste, I know it will be delicious, right, Frederick? That, I can attest to that, <laughs> absolutely. Sensation and perception are so important when you choose what to eat. Dr. Christopher Simons at the Department of Food Science and Technology at The Ohio State University does just that. He looks at sensation and perception and how that impacts our choices. We love salty food. We love fatty food, we love sugary food, but we also know that, especially in significant amounts, it's not necessarily healthy for us. Right. How can we retrain our brains or our olfactory system, brain taste yeah. system, to actually really love yeah. foods that a lot of times are very healthy for us, but just right. don't taste so good? Man, if I had the answer, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> there are potentially ways of trying to overcome some of these issues. So, for instance, adding different types of flavor experiences on top, right? So maybe as you remove um, salt or sugar, you create more sort of exotic flavor, olfactive experiences, right? Is there no kind of biological learned or physiological learned way where you can, you know, whether it's broccoli, I mean, I happen to like yeah. broccoli, but whether it's broccoli and people don't like that, you know, is there a way to hardwire that or is it all about masking with flavors and tricking us to say, this is really cool? So, so you may have heard of what we call conditioned taste aversions. We've all had one, right? I, when I was little, I ate like two or three pounds of white chocolate within an hour, right? Got very sick. And <laughs> now right. just the thought can't of, exactly, <laughs> can't even, can't even Mine think is that. Crest. I'll embarrass crest. myself on television. I ate a tube oh. of Crest toothpaste <laughs> when I was seven. I thought it was so delicious. <laughs> to this day as a grown man, I cannot brush my teeth with yeah. Crest. It's, it's, right. it's a situation. So, so the key there, right, is that we both felt sick within a very short That's time right. frame, right? right? So it's a learned, right? Condition, mm -hmm. taste aversion. So in theory, something like that could happen um, with healthier foods. The problem is with these healthier foods, the benefits don't typically happen until, you know, sometime later, right? Sure. And so we don't pair that feeling better necessarily with the food. Got it. But I think there's other things that we can do as well, even beyond just what we do to the food. In our lab, we can use immersive technologies and we have a variety of different ways that we can do that. We have a big video wall. You know, we also have like the, you know, the goggles, the immersive technology or the virtual reality goggles that, you know, it's, it's much more immersive. What we've really found is the presence of context changes. It changes what people like. It changes what they perceive. So we're also starting to now look at how social interactions now overlay on context, right? So context is one variable that we can manipulate, but now we can manipulate who you're eating with, right? Is it a friend? Is it a stranger? Those things have very different effects, right? So maybe part of it is 
tricking the brain and using some of these flavor you know nuances maybe some of it is when we're migrating into these healthier foods ensuring that the environment is is happy and exciting and playful right and then that's that's part of the experience that's consolidated and so you start to make those associations sure where is taste going where is this research going 30 to 50 years from now 100 years from now so I think there's a lot of really interesting things. I think that we're going to start to have personalized nutrition. So we all have, you know, eye watches or Fitbits now, right? And so we're collecting biometrics all the time, right? This information can start to be fed into these types of systems and algorithms that can start to say, okay, you know, this is the time of day where you need whatever, vitamin A, because you're getting tired or whatever it happens to be. I think the technology in terms of food design also will start to enable that. You know, we start to have 3D printing of foods, right? So now you could even envision where you go home and, you know, okay, according to my biometrics, I need, you know, formula C in a you know, something that looks like a steak. Beep, 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 right? And like Star Trek. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. right. I think there's also a lot of interest in how we can leverage this information in the development of better tasting fruits and vegetables. You know, so one of the problems, people don't like to taste a whole wheat, right? And so if people ate more whole wheat breads and so forth, they'd be a lot healthier, but you know, so few people actually eat it. So we can start to identify compounds that contribute to either the liking or the disliking of those breads. We can start to then link with horticulturists and crop scientists and start to understand, okay, what are the metabolic pathways that are causing the increase or decrease of these particular products? And how can we actually then start to breed crops to have more higher quality sensory characteristics. So gene therapy for good tasting for, food. Exactly. And, and we know that we can use gene therapy and, and breed crops to have a better sensory profile. So now that we've maximized the, the, the efficiency of the crops, now let's focus on these other aspects so that we can actually deliver foods that people want to eat because sure. they actually are tasty. But it sounds like right now we can't perfectly engineer um, the combination of best tasting with healthiest foods. We can socially engineer the kind of atmosphere um, um, context around us to maybe allow us to, to enjoy much more eating some foods that might not taste as great, but are really nutritionally valuable and healthy to Abs us. Is that absolutely. Correct? I think that that's a big piece of it, right? So if we can't make the perfect food, let's make everything around, else around that food as as optimal as we can, the experience, the people, all of those other contextual elements that are part of that process, part of the experience of, of enjoying foods. So Jenny, you're nationally known. You actually ship your great product throughout the entire country. What can you tell us about how you package a product to make sure the end user 500, 1,000 miles away gets a great product? Our packaging is uh, completely moisture proof and so that you, we, you know, we work hard so that you're not um, getting that sort of exchange of flavors going in and out of the package so that we, when we put it in there, it stays there. And that's really, really important. And is it fair to say that the packaging you figured out makes the ice cream taste exactly how it tasted when you made it to a week, a month later when someone might eat it? Or is there something you know that you actually put in the packaging to allow some flavor migration, kind of like a wine that maybe a five month old Jenny's might have even enhanced flavor? Is that a thing? Oh, absolutely. So we don't want flavor to sort of evaporate through the pint um, package, but the flavors will absolutely bloom in the ice creams as it, um, as it ages, sort of like a wine or a cheese. Mm -hmm. um, you can get more pronounced cinnamon or any of the sort of hard spices will actually sort of mellow, but actually weirdly be a little stronger mm -hmm. um, after a little while. Um, some uh, ingredients will actually soften, so we may start with like a sort of crumblier cake on purpose because it will absorb, absorb the sugar from the ice cream, mm -hmm. the sugar syrup, which is never actually frozen in the ice cream, it's always liquid, and it will go into the cake and sort of soften it over time. So there's all sorts of really cool stuff that does happen inside that package after we make it that we know and, and um, want to happen. To your point, Jenny, there's a lot of scientific research going on in the world of food packaging. And at The Ohio State University, we checked in with Dr. Melvin Pascal, who says that preserving flavor is a unique 
area of science. So your work revolves around not just food itself, but food packaging. Can you talk about the impact of packaging around flavor? Well, most processed foods that we see in the grocery store and that we purchase and we enjoy are packaged. Without packaging in this modern society in which we live, our life would be different. So packaging helps to preserve the food. It helps to protect the food. It helps with convenience because we are able to carry the food with us where we want it because of packaging. Because of packaging, we can tell what's inside of the product. We can see the label, we can see the ingredients, we know what we are eating, we know what we are buying. So in a nutshell, packaging is very important in our modern society. Okay, well now we're here in your lab, which I'm really excited to be back at the bench. Um, tell us you know, a little bit about the instruments that you have in here and what are you measuring when you talk about flavor or related to packaging taste? Well, we measure, for example, the water vapor transmission rate of a film and this is mainly plastics. With plastics, we want to know how long it takes for a certain quantity of moisture to get into the package, to cause the product to be spoiled, or to get out of the package to cause the product to be dehydrated. And that works with flavors, because when we have a product, the product has flavors, say for example, orange juice, the flavors will want to get out of the juice so that it could balance its concentration in the environment. And what happens, the package prevents that from happening. So that's interesting because we learn about that in high school chemistry, the idea of osmosis or diffusion going from high concentration to lower concentration. So in any canned food or packaged food, and you talk about orange juice, the flavor, if you will, would actually want to go through the package to be more dilute, to be more balanced. Is that correct? And the packaging makes that intensity stay there? Makes that concentration stay there? That's correct, that's correct, yes. Now some plastics tend to like flavors. It may want to suck the flavors from the food and we call that flavor scalping. So when we decide to package a particular food, we have to be judicious. We have to choose the right material that minimizes flavor scalping. How, how do consumers drive what's inside packaging? Well, one of the consumer trends that we see currently is that people are a little bit concerned about too much chemicals in the food. Uh, you look on the labels and you see a whole long list of all these chemicals. And in this modern society, because information is so readily available via the internet, um, the young people in particular, they want to know what they're eating and they are concerned about too much of these additives in the foods. Is there a movement to create natural or more natural packaging so the packaging itself can be not just non-harmful but actually maybe an additive or even a benefit from a nutritional value? As a matter of fact, yes. Um, currently, in my lab, I have several students who are doing research with what we call edible packaging. You said edible packages? Edible plastics. Okay, now you're talking my language here. And um, we have made plastics from cassava starch, uh, that's called tapioca. Um, we have made it from chitosan. Chitosan is an extract that we get from the exoskeleton of shellfish. Uh, we have also made it from mushrooms. And uh, those are edible packaging, you can eat it. You can use it, say for example, in a pie. You can put the edible film to separate the filling, which is wet, from the crust, which is dry, because you don't want the crust to get soggy. So that puts my product ahead of my competitor because my product will taste better, it will have a better texture. And the, the, there is another thing with packaging, there is a subtle psychology with packaging. We don't want consumers to focus on the package. We want them to focus on the food. But what draws people to the food is the package. How it looks, how it's shaped, colors, etc. cetera. Okay. They, 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 they odor, sure, for example. Sure. And if we could manipulate the odor or how it looks uh, and, and still get people to enjoy the food, which is what they want. People don't buy food because they want the package. They buy the package with the food because they want the food. 
you see? It's like the bee goes to the flower because the bee is not interested in the petal. The bee is interested in the nectar. Sure. What draws the bee to the nectar is the flower. And that's the same thing with the package. Okay, great. So Jenny, this has been terrific. What would be your recommendation or advice for people when they're thinking about combining flavors? What should they consider? We know that pleasure is derived from what you believe about something. So story and what you bring to your ice cream is really important. And I always say flavor surrounds you. So tell your stories through ice cream, whatever stories you want. Be creative in that way. And then just remember that ingredients pop off of one another. So what you combine together, kind of make sure that they highlight each other, whether it's salt and sweet or, um, or sweet and sour, and then they really pop out. Jenny, such a pleasure to have you. Thanks for being on the show with us today. I had so much fun, thank you. That's quite easily demonstrated. QED with Dr. B, join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we'll see you next time quarter gallon, this is half a gallon. Science, I, I quizzed you there when you missed it. Do you want to stir this and tell me if this is anywhere close to what a viscosity should look like? Yeah. Oh yes, very nice. Can I pause for a second? So I put in, I think, a little bit too much liquid nitrogen. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is where I need Robin! <laughs> Robin. Production funding for QED with Dr. B is provided by American Electric Power Foundation boundless energy for brighter futures and by viewers like you. Thank you. About a quarter of a gallon, half and half milk.